1926, a humble motorist guide changed the restaurant world forever. The Michelin brothers published a guide for French motorists. At first, it didn't include any mention of restaurants or food. Instead, it was just typical, mundane information that any tyre company would share. But after a few tweaks and the addition of a restaurant section, it became a hit, and the guide's popularity boosted Michelin's brands worldwide. The success story demonstrates the power of content marketing, an approach that involves the creation and distribution of content to your target audience. I think it has the potential to make or break a business. Business. Failure to do it or to get it wrong and you'll lose customers to competitors, damage your brand and waste resources. But effective content marketing can be a game changer when it comes to brand loyalty, improved discoverability and the most important metric, cash in the bank. In this content marketing episode, we'll discuss how to get it right, particularly for those early startups or small businesses. We only talk about the strategies that have worked for us, whether that's building and growing a bootstrap business, creating a personal brand, a profitable YouTube channel, or successful campaigns we've created for some of the UK's biggest brands. Now to help you succeed, there are seven areas that you need to understand. First, you need to know what it is and whether it's worth doing. Second is how to create content with purpose. The third is understanding where to start if you've never done it before. Fourth is figuring out your volume sweet spot. The fifth is the balance between budget and production quality. The sixth is learning how to measure its success. And seventh, the most important in my opinion, is learning how to close the deal and make more money. Now we're not saying you're gonna become an overnight billionaire, we'll leave that to the gurus. But if you do follow the advice shared in this video, we guarantee your business will have a better chance of being successful. Content marketing is, is basically creating content, surprisingly, um, and using it to, to um, convey a, a certain message that helps you build an audience. Um, the longer you do that for, the more trust you build with an audience, and the theory there is if you've got an audience that trusts you, it's easier to sell to them. That's essentially what it is. So content would be their blogs, videos, posts on social media, yeah. what else? Yeah, I suppose if blogs, if, you, if you're, uh, you know, you're working SEO or you're a business in the 90s um but i think nowadays i think it, it, it it's more um either kind of text-based posts or, or valuable information that you can put out to your target audience for free that's going to bring them in and think oh i could do with a bit of that for my business um it's humor comedy entertainment it's personal stories it's it's anything that's going to going to resonate with the people that you're trying to sell to essentially and what which can come in any form and what content do you use in your own businesses? Uh, well, essentially for Iron Productions, our views are my own. We use uh, a newsletter, we use video, and we use posts on social media. They are the, probably the three things that we use as our main lead gen or lead magnets to bring in new clients. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're pretty similar. I mean, we, we, it's, it's anything that we think is gonna, is gonna get us attention. We're just attention seekers, essentially offended. So we, 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 a lot of what we do is, um, and what we've, what has been some of our most successful stuff nowadays is doing uh, stuff out of home. So doing things in the street, fly posting, you know, uh, billboard campaigns and things like that, but then using that as content on social media. Yeah. Because the, the often the impact of, of out of home stuff nowadays is the impact of it on the online. Um, and also getting uh, uh, doing stuff that's controversial enough that other people will take pictures on our, our behalf and share it to their socials. Yeah. Um, but before that, we, it, it was the, the standard stuff. It was it was video, it was sliders, it was imagery, it was animations, gifs, whatever. Um, and there's yeah. no one thing that kind of like worked or performed better. It's just it's generally a blender mix. It's depending generally on the a business. blender, uh, yeah, because it's rare that you can do the same thing over and over again. And, you know, five years down the line, people are still going to be reacting to it the same way they were and getting the same results. So you you, you have to change it up. You have to figure out new ways of saying things uh, and you have to keep things interesting. So I just advise people to, you know, try as much as possible. Ma marketing uh, is, is all trial and error, right? That's why, that's why people like us have got jobs in it, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just, you know, uh, it's, it's trying as much stuff as possible building on the stuff that works because your audience like it and then being off the shit that doesn't. And that, that is as simple as marketing, marketing is. And the more you do that, the more you uh, start to understand your, what your audience wants to see and the more you recognize the way they engage with stuff and, and you should be able to recognize when it's time to change, change it up and do something different. 
from my uh, personal experience with the um, the content marketing, the thing that worked really well for me, and I go back to a, a very specific example, which was in a startup scenario, I found that um, we had to keep it lean. We didn't have a sales team, stuff like that. I looked at content marketing, especially video and posts, as A, the posts were drawing eyes and attention, but then video could be used to answer questions that my ideal client would have. So that was the key thing for me. I thought, how can I scale my sales team without physically having to interview people and hire salespeople? Mm. And I can only make so many outbound calls. If you make an outbound calls and no one knows who the fuck you are, it's quite difficult. So I've only got a finite amount of, t- a finite amount of time. So if I'm gonna be outbound calling people and they don't know who I am, it was more difficult. But if I could create video content talking about the topics that I knew resonated with them, yep. they'd see it and then they would come to me and they'd already have had value from me. They kind of understood that I knew their pain points mm. um, and it made it easier to sell to those people. So I looked at each video that I put out as multiplying my sales team and multiplying myself. Now, if you yep. put them in the right places where your ideal client is searching for answers, I felt we dropped onto a kind of process to help startups, early mm. startups, especially when you didn't have a sales team. So yeah. that was how I found it really, really worked for us. Is there anything that people should be considering before they even start making content? Yeah. What do you mm. want to get from your content? Do you want to build your personal brand? Mm. Do you want leads for your business? Do you want your business to be known? Because potentially you're looking at selling your business in two to three years time. The content marketing strategy you would follow if you plan to sell your business mm. would be very different to if you wanted to boost your own personal brand and you kind of were the brand, it'd be very different content and how you distribute it and yep. the type of content you'd make would be very different. So you need to be, in my opinion, very clear on what you're trying to achieve and even down to one thing. And then it's easier to then map your content strategy and your content marketing to that thing. So if you're going, well, I'd like to get a million views and I'd also like to get loads of leads for my business and I'd also like to grow my audience by 200,000, yeah. whatever it might be. There's too many things there. Like if I threw three tennis balls at you, chances are you're not going to catch one. And the other important part is is figuring out who it is that you want to speak to and knowing your customer. We we so like I research. Kind of, you would research exactly yeah, what they're so looking you, for. You you re, do, do research, but research uh, is only going to tell you uh, uh, you know a, a certain amount of things. I always have this argument with clients who are like, oh, well, you know, we're thinking of doing a fucking, um, you know, a survey or, uh, you know, yeah. getting a focus group and getting our customers in a room and asking them questions. But the problem with... They won't give you the right the problem with that, Yeah, exactly. The problem with that is when you ask someone a question, they feel obliged to give you an answer regardless of whether they've got one or not, right? They'll just fucking make one up or they'll tell you what you want to hear because they feel like if I just go, hmm, I don't know, I don't really have one. They, 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 they look like an idiot, right? So it's not an accurate way of doing things. You're much better kind of building and learning your audience over a period of time. And you need to account for that. Like I was talking talking about before, you need to account for that period of time where you're gonna be testing lots of different messaging on your audience to figure out how they speak and how they act. Because actions and the way they uh, act, they react to content and act on posts and the way they comment and where they go after that and you can follow kind of their journey and their actions will tell you so much more about your customer and how they act and their buying habits and all the rest of it than it will if you go and fucking sit four of them in a room and do a, do a customer survey yeah, 100%. Um, so how did and, and you guys specifically do that in your businesses so a lot of people talk about yeah. audience personas and it can be quite scary if you've never you've mm. never thought about that it feels like hard work and you're not sure where to start mm. how did you guys specifically identify who you wanted to sell to and then tailor your content yeah. and where did you start yeah so me personally it was i just observed so i knew what products that we had which was online learning uh, in this instance so i knew roughly if a business had a particular job role in their business, they took that um, training and learning development very seriously. So I'd look at the size of the company, if they had a particular job role on LinkedIn, and then I wanted to find out what their pain points were so I could craft my content marketing to match those points. So I would look at the types of conversations they were having, um, and that would be online, on LinkedIn, in um, forums and stuff like that. And I could see the problems that they had with e-learning, online learning, online training. And I just looked at, and I just kind of made a note of different pain points they had. And that gave me an initial idea of what type of content, titles, topics that I should be creating content around. Because I knew then there was a ready-made market that I could talk to in a language that they'd understand and sort of um, share their pain points. But equally, 
they were in a position where they might have had buying power and I could sell to them. So it, there was a few different variables, but essentially it was monitoring and researching the stuff that they said online, pain points, and then speaking to people in that industry as well. Anything different with offended, Dan, or is that pretty much your um, process too? I think I, it, it's kind of difficult to define, but I think it's, it's you know, when I first started off, I can't, I've kind of done it a little bit different. So I'd started off and I was posting for myself because, you know, I was, I was um, uh, freelance copywriting while I was propping up other shit businesses I've, I've tried to build. Um, and the, the kind of way, way it worked for me was as I got those, those kind of freelance clients on the first couple, I started to kind of learn the sort of people that were coming to me and that I could work with, the sort of people I didn't like, um, the sort of products and services that I thought I could write for and that I could sell well, and the sorts of products and services that I want to stay clear of. Um, and it was, a, it was, a, it was just a, a, a learning game and, 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 and kind of learning what my customer ideal customer looks like is probably taking a good you know the kind of three years that we've been doing offended it's taken that amount of time and even now we still get it wrong we still take on people or uh you know or or or, or think um you know uh, some sort of product that we, even though we know in the back of our heads it was shit we think oh no maybe, maybe we could sell this uh, and, and we always, and we get it wrong um we still get that but we're a lot better now at defining the sorts of businesses that we work well with that are the most profitable, uh, that, that are essentially good for us and what we're after. And But that's taken a period of, of, of years. And I kind of, I, I keep trying to impress this on, on, on people and on clients and uh, anyone who asks me advice or I speak to is that the, the whole time thing, you, you're not gonna, you can sit with a fucking research company, one of these data fucking companies, all you fucking want. You can pay them as much money as you want. You can get all these really detailed customer profiles before you start. So you apparently you know exactly who you're going out to and who's going to buy your product. I guarantee in two, three years time, they were wrong. They, they always are. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't kind of define it through data. There's so much more going into it. And it's about how you feel, how you work best, who you work best with. The, uh, there's so many different factors that, that, that contribute that I think generally, I, I, know, I know it's shit advice and a bit woolly, but it, it's about just kind of, kind of learning on the job. And the more you do, and the more you see how your customer, customers react and, and, and work with you, the, the, the better you're gonna know them, essentially. Yeah. No, I, don't, I don't think it's shit advice, I think it's good advice. I, I think. think it's trial and error, isn't it, as well, it, by it, the way? Yeah. Especially for what we're talking here, is early startup, you know, you're just starting out. The idea mm. of spending six months to identify your absolute ideal target audience, you don't know who that is. Yeah. The only way you find that out is actually going out and sell. Well, maybe, we knew that maybe. specifically, don't we, Won't Because we, what we thought originally who and the type of person we were going to sell to at the very, very beginning of Learning Heroes, it wasn't even called Learning Heroes at this point, but um, we thought, oh, yeah, there's definitely a market for this. We could definitely sell to these people. We're going to make courses that help job seekers mm. um, prepare better for interviews and get better jobs, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't end up selling that product to that audience at all. We basically repackaged that the yeah. product and sold it to a completely different ideal client. But that was through trial and error. Yeah. We realized that we were targeting the wrong people, but the, the product was good. So it was the messaging, who we targeted, and how we packaged that product that sort of helped us um, fly or die, essentially. But we obviously, we managed to turn that around. But um, yeah, you can sit there and think this is exactly the person. But I always think with these ideal client avatars, when you have two specific, like nobody's got 2.4 children. But that is what people, it's an average. So if you mm. really were marketing towards your ideal client, there is no such thing as that. No. There's so many variations of that yeah, thing. So yeah, I think yeah. you're right. You kind of identify who would we like to work with, but that does take time and that is through trial and error because we've worked mm. with some people we didn't necessarily want to work with. We've done that in Iron Productions quite often. Yeah. And then you go, why are we doing this? We don't enjoy it. They don't really enjoy it. We kind of, you know, where now you can almost go, we work really well with this type of person, this type of business. But again, that's gone through a learning curve. Yeah. So and it changes all as well. Yeah. You, 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 your ideal customer uh, now might not be the same in a year's time. Your product changes, the market changes. There's so many different changes. So if you start, you know, I just think, you know, and probably people who work in data will tell me I'm full of shit, but I think they're full of shit. But so. equally, conversely, what you don't want to do is market to everybody and not have an ideal no. client or an idea of what you're doing because then you no. are never going to succeed, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Should I even yeah. take it, everyone's got feet. Mm. right but shoes aren't marketed to everyone it's a certain type of shoe for a certain yeah, type yeah. of person they get yeah. niche on their market and even though yeah. it's in a bigger sector yeah. so i think some, there's a lot some, of lessons to some people are barefoot nowadays that's simple, it's, it's yeah. a genuine thing some people have no feet some, some people, people have, have no feet. feet yeah 
three. Yeah. So if you were to sum up that sort of section in terms of audience personas, for yeah. a startup, somebody starting out, small business, you should have an idea of who you're trying to sell to and at a very basic level, make sure your content matches that persona. Mm. But don't go into too much detail because it's likely to change over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're exactly like saying that. he likes long walks and drinking orange juice in the morning, you've probably yeah. gone too far into your ideal client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that yeah, is what yeah, a lot yeah. of these online gurus and yeah. coaches teach you to do yeah, yeah. and call them names. Oh, this is yeah. Bobby. She's this and yeah. she does that and she likes long walks and reading books yeah but what do you sell yeah. yourself night lights or hot water bottles what difference does it make where she yeah. walks and stuff? we had that we had that argument rec uh, recently with a, someone who was doing a bit of um a bit of work for us and i'm sure he won't mind, mind me saying anyway because he'd probably still disagree with me but um What's his and name? they were like uh <laughs> they were like um you know what, what's your uh your, your target customer what are the hobbies and i thought he gives a fuck I don't care what the fucking hobbies are. I care about how much, much money they've got and whether they're going to work well with us and whether they, they need our services and we can, we can sell what they've, they're selling. The irony about that, by the way, the people selling you that shit and mm. telling you to do that shit, they don't know what your hobbies are mm. and they're in your office selling to you. They've yeah. not gone, do you know what yeah. we're looking for? We're looking for a tattooed cover mank that loves gravy and um, boxing. Yeah, or MMA. I, I do love, I do love both gravy and uh, boxing. But you know what I mean? Yeah. But they're not, they're not done that. They're going, you Sometimes need. Sometimes together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we've talked about this. Gravy right? wrestling. Um, yeah. What we're talking about is kind of like the one percenters. And if you're an early startup or yeah. you're just getting out, these are things that you can refine. Yeah. 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 Y
you can do content marketing from the beginning. However, fake it before you make it is dangerous. There's a big difference between yeah. faking it and lying yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and deliberately misleading people and saying you've done work for yeah, yeah, yeah. people and you've achieved certain goals if you haven't. Yeah. If you're yeah. using fake um, examples of things and these are, you've paid for fake testimonials, that's bad. Mm. You shouldn't do stuff like that. But you can be honest. Mm. If you haven't got any case studies and testimonials, you can offer to run your um, service or you could give your product to certain people for free yeah. in exchange for yeah. testimonials. And then you can do some content marketing around the real testimonials and case studies that you've learned. You're not deceiving anybody. The people that are involved in your first client base know exactly what they get themselves in for. They realize it's a bit of a beta test. There might be some teething problems. They can give you mm. feedback because we actually did do those things with Learning Heroes. Do you remember we had certain clients where we wouldn't charge them full price, but then we'd say, what do you really think about this content? You know, which of these resources did you find useful? Which didn't you use? Mm. So then when we did do content marketing, we could say, this is why we include these resources and this is how they've been used in other clients. It's not lying, but we had to wait a few weeks to do that because we had to give away some stuff for free and do some mm. research, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. We had that kind of minimal viable product. We knew it would work. Yeah. We knew someone would buy it. But so it we wasn't done through content marketing. It was direct sales at that point, wasn't it? It was, it was a bottle yeah. of uh, Baileys it taken was... to cash converters. You know, that's one of the first sales we got. Yeah, but you know, you're not even allowed to do that. You no, know, people are supposed to declare that. There's it's a bit of gray bribery. Start, And this is what I mean. Yeah, so <clears> there's <throat> certain things that I think you kind of, you have to do. And you win your first client, you think, oh shit, we've now got to build this thing. We've now got to do the stuff mm. that we say. We had that moment. I remember it was 23rd or 22nd of December. And we didn't even know if the business was going to work or not. Mm. And literally, it was like, if we don't sell something before Christmas, we're going to give up on this idea. Yeah, yeah. And it was literally the I'll last meeting of the there. year. And then they bought it. And at the time, the pricing wasn't even what it went on to become. Again, yeah. it's easy to look back and go, oh, we had this great model. The model kind of changed and we sort of built it to, based on what our clients and people we were talking to were giving us feedback from. Like mm. you said, you change as you go along. Yeah. And we got in the car after and we were like, I can't believe someone's actually paying us this money for this thing. Mm. Shit, we're going to have to deliver it and build it now yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we worked out how to do it so in in some ways yes we did fake it before we made it but we made enough of an example and kind of laid out to them you're our first client you're going to lead us on what we build next so it was kind of like we did it in partnership with our first few clients compare that to what we were three years later we could go very clearly and go this is the people we serve this is what you're paying for these are the resources it's case studies and testimonials on what we've done with the people they were getting the kind of final shiny polished product and that was when our content marketing strategy really came in isn't it yeah i think but now it seems there's more pressure to be doing that from almost from day one yeah but there's pressure to do it yeah. but that shouldn't be at the detriment of making money in sales because i tell yeah. you what if you can't pay for the roof over your head the computers and lights to be on you ain't gonna have a business in six months yeah. no matter how good your carousel is or your yeah, content yeah, marketing yeah. is yeah there's, there's there's something in it there's something in it from starting from from day one and telling the story like you said, I think the days of faking it till you make it are, are, are fucked. I think they're gone. And I think actually the the antidote to that, uh, which you know I always try and kind of sell in and do ourselves as a business to show people it fucking works, is being is being really honest about stuff. Because particularly in the UK, right, we all we, we like an underdog. We back an underdog. People like to support people in getting somewhere. The people people don't like people who go. You know that fucking Joseph fucking whatever his name is. He used to be on The Apprentice. That Belen do. Uh, put that post on about I'm in first class but me and my brother are going to get private what, jet the next year and, and, yeah, shut Joseph the fuck, yeah, yeah shut the fuck up yeah, he's, yeah anyway um, but, but people like that people are, people hate nowadays it's not impressive no one's fucking impressed there's a ton of you dickheads on Instagram it's, it, it, you know what What people want now is transparent and real and, and, and honest brands and and that means um, when you start from day one I mean number one make sure you've got something interesting to say don't just fucking post every day with Trying to build a business. Here's me and my first employee, and it's your little sausage dog. Here's our, few, here's our <laughs> first <laughs> computer chair. <laughs> Shut up, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's it, make sure it's interesting. It's valuable, valuable to your to your target audience, right? That's number one. But the other thing is, be honest about your mistakes and your flaws. People love people who are honest about failures, and then tell them what they've learned from it, all the, all the rest of it, and uh, and who kind of laugh at themselves and don't take it too seriously. And, and if if more brands and and, and more um, smaller businesses did that. I like that. You analogy. build you build more you build more trust with your audience. So we, mm. we, we had a we went and saw a business this week and it was like, Oh, these are the messages you want to get across, really positive and this is why it's good and this is why we don't really have a USP there, but this is why we're better than this brand and 
But to be honest, if I was really honest with you, the platform's a bit shit and it's a bit a bit thingy there. And I said, put that in your hands. Yeah. Your customers already know where you're shit, right? Yeah. If you don't tell them where you're shit, they're going to tell you where you're shit. That's the, it's going to come out in reviews. They're going to fucking post it all over social media. They're going to give you shit. They're going to quit. They're going to leave subscriptions, all the rest of it. If you've already, it's like, um, you know, like the kid in school who, um, you know, had a fucking massive conk, right? He's got two options. I've got a massive conk, right? I either go, I either go, I don't want to talk about my conk because I know it's fucking big. And what everyone goes, does is call him fucking Big Nose Barry, right? Otter. So big, you've got Big Nose Barry. Oh, yeah. Otter. You've got Big Nose <laughs> Barry there, right? What Big no Bo Nose Barry could have done, and you always see the sort of kids in school, if he'd gone to school from day one, start taking the piss out of his own, own nose, no one else wants to take, take the piss mm -hmm. out of it. I, I, I was thinking of you, weirdly, listening to um, Eminem, and I thought, this is this is Dan's strategy. When he's going into a battle rap... Were you watching 8 Mile? Because I'm cool like that, yeah. Dan <laughs> the kids watching 8 Mile. But... 20 years late. In terms of rap, he owned all of his flaws, didn't he? In yeah. the, And then it disarms people and it makes you more relatable yeah. because actually he's been on it. Whereas, like you say, if he'd have gone in there and yeah. shouted, he's the biggest rapper in there. You want to bring a rap analogy in there, don't you? Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I was better just going to say, mine, you know. you got to rap it, though. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I am white. I'm a fucking bum. I live in a trailer with my mom. <laughs> that's it, yeah. But that's what, he, is, he is white. He definitely is white. Look, <laughs> he's owning sense. it. He's owning it. <laughs> But it suddenly yeah. makes him more relatable yeah. in it because yeah, like, oh, he's yeah. being honest now yeah. about yeah. his flaws but and he's, he's disarming other people. But every, every, everyone's got to do it. And honestly, if, if you're a small brand, just concentrate on being that transparent with your customers. It, it'll work wonders. It'll work wonders. I think because of the way content's gone, so many people are now just repurposing and reposting other people's content and opinions and regurgitating it. Um and then it seems to become less useful every time it's regurgitated. What are your views on that? I hate it. And if anything, it's they're all following the same formula. And yeah. it's just ridiculous. Like if I see somebody else share basically Justin Welsh's, this is how you do, you know, do Twitter threads or this is how you grow audience. It's like, but you're not inspiring. You're yeah. not someone I want to follow. You are just some a parrot essentially. But I don't think they realize the damage that's doing to them long term because they're getting mm. short term um attention and engagement from other yeah. equally nauseating gimps that yeah, do the same yeah, thing yeah, yeah. they are just a group of gimps yeah. idiots on mainly linkedin but it's also on facebook as well where they just reshare the same stuff mm. if they were in a whatsapp group you know it whenever they sent it in it would just say forwarded many times on the top that is mm. basically their content they're that guy it's not write your own jokes. I heard someone mm. say it's the framework. Justin Welsh can post that way because he's built up a big audience over a period yeah. of time. Yeah. So and it's the framework. When he delivers that post, it works. It can be a three li three yeah. line three line um, uh, post. So what you've got there is you've got people on LinkedIn that are sharing what Justin Welsh does to grow his audience to three million. Let's just say, and they're trying to distill it down into this one thing, and then give it to the masses and say this is how you do it but it's not going to work for them because they're not just in watch. Gary V can post a tweet, so can do a tweet with just a fire emoji on there and that's gonna get retweeted 30,000 times. Mm. I bet if you just did that exact same tweet, you wouldn't get the same results. Yeah, it's cool. when people are looking to try and find the 1% when they're not mm. even doing the 80% of the work correctly. The thing yeah, that's gonna get yeah. the most results, they're not doing that. They're always trying to look for that one, that tiny bit of secret sauce, that one hack, it just looks ridiculous if you've not achieved a thing that you're saying you can, like we've all seen the youtube videos where it goes here's how to get a million views in show three months and it's got a hundred views and you're like how good was <laughs> yeah, your yeah, advice yeah, yeah. if you can't even do it on your own yeah, show yeah, me yeah. how you went from zero to a hundred thousand a year before you start telling me as a business owner how to make a 10 million pound business and mm. i bet most of them can't and this is my problem with any of these business consultants that are sat at their kitchen table at home and the only business they've ever ran is that business they're self-employed in you're not an entrepreneur, you're an unemployable gimp. So what we're saying is do things to support the evidence of why you're good, make sure your product's good, and don't sell things that don't work because you'll be a con man. Essentially, yeah. yeah I, and I don't yeah. think it's that hard yeah. to remember them rules. Yeah, and be transparent. And so you've done all of that, and you're ready to start now. What is the first steps of starting to produce content? Um, do you need to think about your unique selling position, USP, um, your keyword identification? How would you start? Done. The most valuable thing that you can do with your audience to start off with is figure out a way that you're either going to give them something that they want for free that's kind of related to your product, but it's not about your product, or entertaining them, right? You entertain people, you make them laugh, 
Um, you shock them a little bit, which is what we try and do, um, uh, and that creates a certain sort of emotion and connection to want them to for them to want keep, want to keep coming, uh, coming back. Are there any examples of, of someone who's done that really well? Do you think, or anyone you've worked uh, with in the past? A good example is um, Slim Jim's, which is a it's a meaty stick. You know, it's like a pepper army basically right. in America. Their 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 whole social uh, media strategy is all about entertaining people with ridiculous memes, right? But they didn't start on that. If you looked at their old page, it was it was Slim Jim's going, "We sell meaty sticks. Here's a meaty stick. Buy a meaty stick, right?" Um, and then some bloke parodied their account, set up Slim Jim's, started doing memes, taking the piss out of meaty sticks, got more followers than Slim Jim's. <laughs> Everyone's laughing about it. So Slim Jim's went over to him, and they've either paid him money. And, and bought him off it, or but I think they've actually employed him as well. So now Slim Jim's has put both the pages together, and now he runs the official Slim Jim's page, and that's what it's become because the focus is on on entertainment. And they kind of realise that trying to ram meaty sticks down people's throats rather than entertaining uh, entertaining people. Why are you I don't laughing? know why I don't know why I You're laugh. a child. You're a literally. Child. Child. <laughs> <laughs> you both laughing. I didn't laugh. The, uh, mm. But but rather than entertaining people, um, uh, they kind of got that wrong in the, in the first instance. But brands can learn something from that. Mm. Be be the be the Slim Jim's parody account, not the Slim Jim's meaty sticks. Yeah. So there's another quote as well. It takes twenty years to make an overnight success. Is it important that people are realistic at this early stage? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, 100%. also don't do something for twenty years if it's not getting results. Don't think, oh, it, it, it might happen this. <laughs> you, I mean, <laughs> One day. You know, you know what yeah, I mean? It's like old Gill off the Simpsons, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but so what, how would you advise? So I'm people. coming to you for the first time. I'm like, like, like you said, I've got a brand new product. I'm really excited about it. How long have I got to be putting out stuff before I'm likely to see some sort of uplift? The, the, uh, honestly, uh, you get asked this question all, all, all the time, but how long is a piece of string? I mean, the, like Mike said, there's got to be a cutoff point, right? If you've been hammering away at a business for, for 30 years and you've, you've still not made a sale, just, you just call it a day. Go, go on the door. Either you, you or the product's rubbish. Or yeah, there's no market for it. Exactly. There's no mark, product market, market fit. But at the same time, don't be... Don't be expecting uh, real results straight away and celebrate kind of small wins and learn from them as well. So if you do a couple of posts that resonate, you get a load of your target audience on there and you, you enter into loads of conversations, right? That's a small win. You know you've kind of, you're kind of onto something, right? Um, and you can start building on that. Um, but that does take time to kind of figure out what your target audience want and you've got to give it a, a little bit of time. There's the 95-5 the rule. And that is, they reckon at any one point, your ideal client, only 5% of the market you could possibly sell to is actually mm. looking ready to buy right now. Yeah. So I always think with any of this type of marketing, especially content marketing, the, the main focus of your content and any marketing that you do, advertising, paid or um, organic, mm. should be to that 95%. If you can be in front of them, keep them entertained, give mm. them value, um, answer some of the questions that they have, talk to them about topics that they traditionally talk about, you know, in, in mm. their peer groups. When it comes to that time, they move from being the 95% into the 5% and they're looking to buy, mm. they might, and that's just a might, there's no guarantee, think of you as one of the options. Yeah. Now, if you're an underdog brand or you're a new brand or a new startup, chances are you're probably going to be competing with an established band, mm. brand already. Yeah. So all you're trying to do with your marketing essentially is putting yourself as the other option that mm. gets considered. Then you can blow them away with how you treat customers and your customer experience yeah. and your USPs and stuff like that. But essentially, that's what you're trying to do. So you are mm. right. There is no um, time frame to say, if you've not had a lead in three weeks, this doesn't work. Yeah. I would say, if you are going to do this seriously, it's graft and its commitment mm. i would say it's minimum six months before you can start yeah, to minimum. possibly get yep. sales from this stuff yep. however what you'll find is and this is what happened in my own experience when i did this for learning heroes i thought the first nine months was quite difficult i felt like i really had to convince people why they should listen to me why they should buy our products even just try our products just have a mm. look at it on a free trial it was very difficult because you you're doing two things there. First of all, you're trying to tell them who you are and what you do, and then that you've got a product that can solve their problem. Once you've kind of got rid of one of them things, it becomes you know twice as easy or half as difficult to sell to them. Mm. What I found was, once I kept putting content, content out consistently, and that was either written content or video content, for that sort of nine month period, 
I'd get a couple of inbound calls a week. Mm. Then it'd be like five inbound calls a week and 10 inbound calls a week. And they would revert back to or mention something that they'd seen three months before, four months before. Oh, I saw you did a video answering this question. We had that similar situation. So we tried it. It actually really helped. Yep. Can you help us with X, Y, Z? Yep. I felt like there was a tipping point, And this is only from personal experience. I'm not saying this will be for everybody. And it was that nine month point where all of a sudden I felt like selling's becoming easier because more people know who we are. More people have heard us talk about the same problems that they've got in their business and they've discovered content themselves. And I thought that was the key. They felt like they had discovered our content themselves rather than mm. it being paid and forced down their throat. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hadn't interrupted their day and gone, hey, do you want to buy a... Uh, do you want to buy a plunge pool? Or do you want to buy an ice bath? Mm. Well, no, I'm, I'm on here because my uh, printer's run out of ink. Mm. It was more like they would, it'd be people that were searching for spe specific things and finding my content. Mm. I felt the, what do you call it? The power had shifted. Like, yeah. Oh, this is a guy that knows what he's talking about. He's not begging for a sale. He's giving value. He's answered some problems already. He's probably somebody we should speak to when we are ready to change providers or buy this product. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and, interesting, mate. And, and that's what I felt happened. It, it, it ties into it, because Dan, you mentioned entertainment and we've had some success with entertainment. I guess yeah. that's what we're doing now, but also kind of, that's quite hard to pull off, I think, entertaining people and getting it right. Well, that's what, when yeah, it's your yeah, initial yeah. goal, especially. Yeah, when you're in it, because yeah, yeah you yeah. really, you want to hire someone. I know, I, know a, I know a couple of uh, creative agencies that might be able to help you that's it well i genuinely yeah. think you, you kind of maybe want to wait until you can afford to pay someone yeah. professionally to do that side yeah. Mm. yeah where a good place to start that's worked for us is value driven content yeah um well, that's the other thing which isn't as sexy like, or anything but yeah, it yeah. ties into what you say there because yeah. it builds trust and when they're ready you're kind of like known as the person in e-learning yeah. because you've been putting out really yeah. good so there's a th mm. there's a quote that if you're not afraid of what you're giving away you're not giving away enough mm. what do you think around that I think you get a reward, like you you guys are doing it now, you're giving yeah, away lots yeah. of free content that someone else might yeah. be quite nervous because you'd be like, oh, this is a paid consultation. Yeah. But actually the payoff, in, if, yeah. you give, if you give lots of good stuff away for over yeah. a long period of time and don't necessarily ask for the sale off the back of it, yeah. we've had success with that. We've, yeah. we've, done, we've, we've done the same thing. And even with the, with, you know, releasing the book, if, you, if, you, if you'd read, especially at that time, I think my thoughts probably changed. Um, but the, a lot of the stuff that I'd, I'd written in there were, were um, was basically everything I do, right? So we, uh, you'd assume someone can read that, or some people assume, that's why they don't give free stuff away. Um, someone can read that and just do it. But the reality, reality is, like, if, you, if you're selling a service particularly, or, or even a product, you can give value to people, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna be able to execute it like you can. But Which means that they'll read it and go, oh, that's really interesting. I kind of get how it works now. I've got more of an understanding of it, but I'm still gonna go to them and get them to do it for me. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. And I, I also think as well, if people, see what you're giving away for free. They Often the thought process is, I might be wrong, but if this is the shit they're giving away for free, imagine what the pay stuff's like. Mm. Imagine how much that's gonna help me or how much <laughs> yeah. better it's gonna be. Yeah, ours but, is no different. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's interesting what you said there. Um, I often think sometimes, like, I mean, so a business here, if you were a startup and you're a new business, and I would say, you know, don't come to us and spend 25 grand, 100 grand, or whatever, do all this marketing campaigns with us. Yeah. Just go into Vamo and learn this stuff and do all the basics and fundamentals you can do anyway for cheap. You don't even have to spend money with us. But then they've got a business to run. Yeah. If their business is, I don't know, um, installing solar panels and selling solar panels or whatever, why do they want to be making funny videos and coming up with creative and all these mm. ideas and coming up with a content marketing strategy and all that type of stuff? They just go, well, hang on, for my business to work, I need to be selling... Uh, solar panels and installing them because we're a small business mm. i'm going to pay somebody that's going to bring in this business for me and we can just close more of that mm. business so it's almost like you know you pay people to do the bits you can't do right and mm. that is the same with marketing yes you can go on a course read the books and try and do it yourself mm. but who's then doing the sales who's running your business so i think give away free stuff yeah. it shows how knowledgeable you are credibility authority then you can upsell to those people that display some sort of interest in the content they've seen mm. or when they come to you, is my opinion. Give away for free information, charge for implementation and strategy and actually do yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that yeah. is a big you push know, to I'll it. tell you what, how yeah. to do it. You can either do it yourself or mm. you can pay us to do it. And I guarantee we'll probably be able to do better at it than you can because yeah. you sell bouncy castles or, yeah. or you install, you know, soft drink machines in pubs. We do content marketing for lots of businesses, mm. some in your sector. So we've got a good idea of what will work. Yeah. And that's why I give away stuff for free, I think.
Yeah, you're agreeing with Tony Robbins there, right? So he he says, make your free material better than everyone's paid material. Yeah, it'd be but nice yeah. if he followed his own advice there, though. He's got some of the shitest content that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> but again, he's built a personal brand up to Facebook. He's got a certain number of gimps that will just agree with anything he says because he's he's got himself into that position. Mm. You can't compare yeah. yourself to Tony Robbins because you're not seven foot four with hands the size of spades. <laughs> yeah, we're back to framing, aren't we, with that then? Because yeah. Tony, Tony Robbins, when he says that and he gives his free material, it's based on his previous. Yeah. Um, yeah. So someone might listen to us because we've grew a YouTube channel. That was my Tony Robbins impression. Yeah. So yeah. someone will listen to us because you, we've grown a YouTube channel to 100,000 followers. So we can legitimately talk about that. So mm. you should be talking about the things you've actually done or can help with, not just here's how to. Yeah. Otherwise, you just become one of them gimps I spoke about, which says this is how you grow your audience to 100,000. Well, you've got 1,000. So what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Sure and that, that yeah. and that's aimed at everybody on LinkedIn, pretty much. That's basically got an illuminous colored background on the profile picture. Yeah. I saw one today actually, and he was talking about you know the gym and how he helps his mental health and stuff like that. You've been six times, mate. What are you want about? Mm. Ain't buying a gym program from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Anyway, I've lost weight. <laughs> Been going to the gym, aren't I? <laughs> so the so the takeaway there is to is is to show, not tell. So only talk about the things that you've done or can genuinely help. Most people can't show in, and that is the problem. Uh, yeah. So don't overinflate at that point. No. Be honest yeah. about the flaws and where football, you start. They say it's in football, don't they? Show us your medals. You know when you've got people that are saying, oh, you know, this is what you should do, da, da, da. well, show us your medals then. Are you, who are you going to listen to? The person that's won the Champions League five times mm. or the person that played Sunday League? Like, whose opinion mm. is worth more in who are you going to, do you know what I mean? And if you've, got, if you've not got anything decent to say at that point, maybe spend more time working on your product and helping people because yeah, then yeah, suddenly yeah, you're yeah, going to have yeah. more interesting things to yeah. talk about. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. So there's, no, there's another quote by Pat Flynn of uh, riches are in niches, niches, depending if you're American or British. So talking about niche in your business, is that a good place to start? Like it, it's, it's hard if you go broad with your content, mm. but actually if you want to be the number one accountant in Warrington, it's probably yeah. quite easy to own that space in terms of content delivery. Yeah. But I think you do need a niche to market to. You do need a niche to sell your product to. Yeah. Because you don't want it to be too broad. Because you kind of do need some focus. You need to focus and someone that you know that you can sell to and somebody that you know that you like to sell to because they meet certain criteria that you've got up there. So you do need that niche. <clears throat> you don't want it to be too super niche. So you don't want it to be... Yeah. Super niche is a wank. It's a wank way of saying it. <laughs> you don't want to be too niche you kind of want mm. a loose ish so you talked to mike about um working your way up the leagues previously yeah. which i thought was quite a nice way of explaining it <sighs> yeah uh, so that that was essentially you want to kind of win your battles with similar sized companies at the time like look you're mm. not you know when you post online you're not going to get the same type of engagement as kim kardashian so there's no point trying to compete with her for whatever the fuck she's selling using the same hashtags and the same strategies yeah what you want to do is and taking your analogy where you said did you say accountants in warrington mm. A great city, town, if you've never been there. Uh, so, but what what you want to do is you almost want to go like, what are the other accountants in Warrington doing? How do I stand out against these guys? And how do I win their clients, the type of business that they're winning? Yeah. Win that battle first. Once you've won that battle, then you can look at, all right, so what are now accountants that are doing maybe 50 grand a month in revenue mm. doing? How are they marketing their business? Who are they having some real good luck with? Or oh, they're doing really well with trades businesses. So I'm going to now do a campaign targeting their kind of customers, but I'm going to do it better than them. And then that's mm. you moving up the leagues. Then once you've become a sort of nationwide, well-known um, accountancy firm, then you can go start doing all the big things that these big people do and start taking their clients mm -hmm. on them. I think too many people, when they're in the zero to 100,000 revenue um, um, stage of a business or with like less than five people, are looking at unicorns and are looking at the absolute elite in their industry trying to compete with them, copy mm. the things that they do. Yeah. And let's be honest, 18 months ago, yeah. two years ago, you wouldn't have had a big marketing agency in London giving a fuck what offended did or no. caring. And no. you probably they still weren't. Don't. <laughs> you know, but they, you probably weren't looking at them saying, we're going to do the things the way that they do because yeah, they might be 14, yeah, yeah. 15 years into their journey, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how they pitch for business, mm. even down to the language that they use, doing slide decks, going and presenting mm. to a board, charging a hundred grand for an idea, let's just say, yep. you wouldn't have done that. What you'd be doing is, who's going to give us a chance locally? Yep. Who is the kind of person we think we can do something with? You might have even made direct approaches to certain people saying, oh, here's a, a business in Manchester we think we can do something with. They're a bit quirky there, new or you might have met them in the pub or something like that, and that's how you get your first few clients. 
you're not mm. going to be doing that when you're at the 100,000 to a million stage or no. the million to 10 million stage. No. You kind of have to work your way up the leagues and you have to win your battles and become yeah. the best in your thing. And then you go up in and then you start, you've, you've now got some case studies, some testimonials, some revenue coming in where you can start winning these battles, mm. you know. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that as well. The other thing that you can do, as well as looking at other businesses, what I do is look at those the businesses on that level and ask yourself, what are all those businesses doing? And then don't do that. You know, we had a similar uh, discussion about chat GPT being able to tell you everything that you don't want to be doing because that's everything that everybody else is doing. And and uh, we the amount of businesses that we get coming to us who say things like, oh, in our industry, we can't do different though, or in insurance, this is the way it's done. You have to follow this thing. And actually, and then and then in the same breath, they're telling me that their product or service is, is disruptive. No, the whole point of disruption is you're disrupting everything. Your market has to be disruptive. Your messaging, you don't want to do. If your product's doing exactly what, uh, it, it, something that no one else is doing in the market, then so should your market in your tone of voice and your messaging. It's like, perfect, ex perfect example was, um, our, our uh, recent client, um, Pharmacy Online, a kind of um, you know um, medium-sized online pharmacy. Their best performing ad was uh, was a bouncer walking into a toilet, hearing someone sniffing behind the cubicle, boots open the door, just turns out the guy sat there on the toilet with loads of tissue and he's got cold. And it just, the, the tagline was caught sniffing. It's a fucking ad about taking cocaine, right? Uh, biggest week in sales I've ever had. Mm. Right, and that's because it's disruptive. It's disruptive. It's something else. when you when you see that you think no way has a pharmacy done that ad, and it's it, it's completely different. I think it, as a small ads, business, even that, as ads you did about the erectile dysfunction, erectile dysfunction was really that, good as well. and you even banned. did that on a local level in terms of doing it in the yeah. with the trailer, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's the kind of thing exactly. like he's winning his local battles. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I guess the takeaway from this section is kind of yes, there are riches in niches. We we got we made our money. In it sounds stupid in English. Yeah. That riches is in niches. In, in riches in niches. I think yeah. it's American. In doesn't, doesn't work in English, no. does it? Um, but we made our money in e-learning, and we you know people might be slightly worried about how far they have to be disruptive. All yeah. we had to say was e-learning's boring. We were the first yeah. people to say e-learning yeah. is boring. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't have to be like yeah. obviously. Oh no, like not the right end of the scale. You don't obviously. have to do a cocaine ad. No. If you're yeah, an accountant. Yeah, it's no. just it was just kind because of that's no, an example of how far. We push it in an industry there yeah. that you wouldn't expect people to, to, to go yeah, that far. Yeah, you can't say those things. But it's saying yeah. our example that you've given there, and straight away it kind of, oh, no, we think e-learning is boring as well. Yeah, we. So then they mm. want to, it kind of makes them a bit curious about, well, what are you doing that's different now? Because you've acknowledged the same thing that most of the other industry won't go, e-learning is boring and we know we make it for a living. So we're like, all right, so what's different about yours? But equally, it also give a bit of needle to our competitors as well because they're mm. thinking, well, hang on, you can't say that about our industry. Well, we can, because yeah. it is, and we are going to say this stuff. So very similar, even though it was, a, again, a boring industry, e-learning is yeah. quite boring. It was, you can position yourselves as a real alternative. Yeah. But if you are a real alternative and you genuinely believe it, and a lot of businesses haven't got a USP, yeah, yeah, yeah. they go, well, I'm the USP, you're not the USP, you can't sell that yeah, stupid. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if yeah. you've got real identifiable USPs, and you really are offering alternatives to, to the sector and industry that, that you're competing with, you mm. can really provide a real alternative yeah. with your content marketing. How much is enough? Which is obviously a lot of it depends on the business. Grant Cardone thinks volume wins, right? So um, famous book, 10X Rule. I actually read that walking to work at Learning Heroes. And he, he has a section in there where he says, if people aren't annoyed by you and your marketing, you're not doing enough. And mm. then it was like a couple of weeks later in the pub, one of my mates was like, seen your ads absolutely everywhere it's doing my head in mm. and it was one of those moments where i thought ah kind of mm. maybe we're starting to get there now yeah. um but equally how do we know how much is enough to be putting out mm. there i guess maybe if we could talk from our own experiences how much do you put out how much do you advise the client uh, my approach is is less is more uh it's unless i think something particularly when it comes to offended's brand unless i think something's definitely going to bang and definitely going to work with our target audience and i'm usually right um, I don't bother. Uh, and that can mean sometimes that offended as a brand and myself online on, on, on LinkedIn, I, I go, I can go two weeks sometimes without posting. You don't, you don't hear of me, but I know that when I do it, it's going to get the, the reaction, uh, a, a lot bigger reaction than most people would get a lot of attention, a lot of conversations and probably bring me in a few leads. And, and then I'll spend the next couple of weeks dealing with them rather than and dealing with my business and my clients work. So I know it, it, one, it takes less pressure off me to have to come up with good ideas all the time. Um, number two, it gives us space in between content to manage the conversations and things that are happening. If you're only a one-man band and you're having to manage conversations all the time and figure out where the leads are coming from and 
that's that's kind of one of the one of the um, pros of doing it. The cons are you you don't build an audience as quick generally. Um, you um, if you are leaving it a, a couple of weeks and that one piece of content that you thought was going to bang doesn't bang and that's the only idea you've got and then you're four weeks before you know it four weeks six weeks eight weeks before anybody's even heard from you again. Um, that's a problem. That's that's one way to, to kill an audience, and and it's very very hard. You, you know you'll you'll know from building an audience once you've got one that if you lose that audience and then after try and build it again, it's a fucking nightmare. And you can do that if you disappear. You you, you might have to do that. Sorry, we did that on YouTube so. a little bit. We didn't we take a year out? There's two things about yeah. about this though that you're saying, and this is just as you've been talking, it's made me think of it. There's a difference though between offended and Dan Kelso, right? I mean, people mm. think Dan Kelso offended. So as yeah. the business, then would would offended go two weeks without posting, or would Dean do a post? Yeah. Would Molly do a post? Would uh, Jay? Would anybody else do a post in that time? You're not posting, um, and I'm talking for the business. Sometimes, but it just we still follow that rule of we don't force it. So if I'm posting, they're posting. I'm very, very. I'm Does very, that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, there? yeah, definitely. Because if I'm posting or they're post, I'm very pr protective over the offended brand because it's always done well. Most people, most of the content we put out bangs, um, uh, and for me it's I'm, I'm quite protective of that so sometimes it can be or sometimes we might have a brilliant post that's right for the company page and not right for me or the, the company has a as a so how much i'd say, say, say you're actually I'd posting say a, as a as a as offended in terms of yeah. how much content would you say you're putting out as a post per week would you say so across across and that's across all yeah staff. across all staff and all channels i, I, reckon, say I reckon, staff or do you say friends employees <laughs> um comrades we, Com we call them. <laughs> um um, it could be anywhere, mate, from from fucking three, four pieces to to max seven or eight. Yeah, max. And that's what I mean. I don't think there's a, a yeah. answer. And by the way, by my second point, I was yeah. going to make. So I said two, and I only give you one. See, so everyone would be thinking, "Where's yeah, the was second it? point?" <laughs> it yeah. must have gone out in the edit. You didn't say it. <laughs> the second point was going to be: Do you think that's because you're now Dan Kelso yeah. with I don't know how many followers you got? Ninety thousand, eighty thousand, seventy thousand, something like that. Uh, would you have been like that thing. when you first started your first business? Would you have gone, I'm only going to post every two weeks? Does that make sense? So uh, when you had um, uh, Vocal, Vocal, Vonkel? Vonkel. Vonkel. Yeah. When you had Vonkel, yeah. would you have posted every two weeks then or would you have posted a lot more regularly then? I posted more regularly, but it was all shit. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I get this. But yeah, so that's, I, that's I, the um, challenge, I think. This I think is yeah. the thing. Like that probably volume is good and necessary and mm. maybe we underestimate how much we need to be posting but to be creative and create good stuff all the time is tiring and you're probably going to run out. Yeah. yeah. And especially if, especially if you do right. it as a job. Yeah. I think <laughs> Dan's right saying when he's posting um, and it's bang and it does really well and it brings in enough business, yeah. chances are when you're building your brand uh, or your the business mm -hmm. and you're looking for leads and stuff like that and doing content marketing, it's not going to bang no. to start with. So mm. I kind of think the answer, uh, while we would say, I would say to fucking post all the time, I have yeah. no rhyme or reason. Sometimes I think something and write it, post it. Oh, yeah. It's not even spelled right. And then I've got to go back and roll. And sometimes yeah. I'll go, why have I even posted that? Like, it doesn't make any yeah, sense. But yeah, I've yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I just it's thought... It's interesting you say that because there's a guy, Alex Homozy, whether you believe him or not, he, he built a big gym style business, flipped it, uh, 46 million. So he, you know, he did all right. Yeah. Um, but, but he talks about his... So his content strategy is to... Te he tests on Twitter. He just puts out whatever his thought is at that moment, a bit like you do with LinkedIn, I guess. Yeah. And he, I think he, at the time he was when he was building up his audience, he was doing five tweets a day. Mm. And then um, whatever was getting the biggest engagement, he'd then bulk record that as longer form content on a specific day. Clever. So he, I think he, he called it a 93-7 split. Yeah. So 93% of the time working in his business, 7% of the time creating content. Yeah. Worked out about four days a month, content creating, sit down. He's got all this data on what's been working well on Twitter as his kind of test bed yeah. and then he turns that into long form video shorts all the stuff we see that works yeah. but not like super creative like your stuff mm. it's just like giving opinion mm. value driven I mean stuff the, the, stra the strategy is great yeah, the strategy is not bad that's, yeah. kind, of, that's, not bad. But that's kind of what yeah. I follow with comments I've said this before when I do um, like the Waffle House um, strategy in terms of when I'm wanting to build an audience but I test comments on other people's posts so if other people are posting about things that i've kind of got an interest in and i know that i could sell to that audience to yeah. i will sometimes take an opposing view or i will deliberately give a bit of needle to see what kind of reaction the comment gets and then i know that could then be a piece of longer well thought out content marketing at a later date and that's what i do i bank like my top comments and think right i'm going to turn that into 
mm. a, a decent piece of work, whether it be a video or a topic or to talk about or a written post. I do follow a similar thing, but I didn't know we did that with tweets. I don't know on Twitter so much. My only challenge, and I guess, is, is because I'm sort of like more the op side of the business where I don't necessarily have as much time to test content and post. Yeah. I do it in like little fits and starts, which is useless. It's like pointless doing it. Um, but I'm lucky that I've obviously we've, there's two of us, so I don't have to worry about it so much. But it is hard if you're in the nuts and bolts of doing to try and make time. But you because, say uh, it is hard. Yeah. And also I think some people, and this is where they get it wrong, they then focus doing that stuff more than they do actually selling their product yeah. and improving their product yeah, and actually yeah, yeah. servicing clients yeah. or recognizing when it's someone's gone, I actually want the thing that you sell. Mm. Someone come and now pitch to me or sell that product to me. Yeah. Because sometimes that's easy because I bet it's easy now to go, well, I'm just on Facebook all day. Just do random posts and oh, mm. that one got 10 likes, that one got 12 likes, yeah. whatever. But now what? What are you going to do with that? Was it a good post that you're going to turn into some lead gen content or are those likes from your ideal client? Mm -hmm. Can you sell to those people? You shouldn't stop selling and improving your product and improve, improving your brand and your message at the, um, instead of, well, what I'm trying to say, you know what I mean? Yeah, but trying don't, to, but don't, but you can't just focus on, you can't just focus on trying to do content. Content marketing on. is yeah. essential. If you're yeah. sitting on LinkedIn for four or five hours a day, just posting content and just talking, but not doing anything with what comes back, the feedback, yeah. what's banged or what's not, you yeah. are wasting your time. Yeah. I would much rather do one post a week yeah. and then you sell yeah. and chase up and follow those leads or one post a day yeah. and follow up them leads and then book calls in and do yeah. But that's what we—that's exactly what we're doing. It's like you—you—you yeah. you, you said it before. Anyway, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's—it's the—it's the, the posting and coming up with a strategy that works, which is hard enough. Is only is, is only half of it. Yeah. The other half is what you then do with yeah. that afterwards, right? Okay. To sort of wrap that section up. So, how do you decide what the right amount of content is? I guess what we're saying is, um, if you're going to do it yourself, then allocate a percentage of time that doesn't take you away from the day-to-day -day operations of your business and, and selling. Um, bring somebody in to the business specifically to do that job or outsource it to an agency that can do it for you. Yeah. And there's no right or right wrong answer on the frequency. Yeah. So there's a quote, content matters, not the rapper. Do you believe that um, you need high production values or fancy studios to start again it, it's it's because we, we keep giving these like woolly answers where it's like well it depends yeah but it genuinely does de depend on what you're doing right if you're a, an accountant or, or or you're like ian murphy and you work in cyber security and you do some sketchy videos that's probably funnier to your audience and it's more personal uh, personal for you um but if you're a, a kind of product-based band, particularly one that's expected to be aesthetically pleasing, like a beauty brand, mm. there has to be some sort of, of setup and the production value does have to go up a little bit, even for the likes of TikTok. Mm. Any examples of you guys doing things on a shoestring budget that, that has worked in the content marketing space? Uh, you got your stickers. Yes, the sticker one's probably the one that we got a lot of business from. So for anyone that doesn't know that story, we went and got some stickers. Um, we wanted to sponsor an event or do something at an event that would make us stand out and stupidly because we knew fuck all about business we thought that you could just sponsor like the breakout section or like you know a stand or whatever yeah. for a couple of hundred quid but we were quoted like six seven grand to sponsor like you know um areas of this thing so we thought mm. how the fuck can we get in front of everybody for cheap mm. and we just thought well Everyone says, don't piss away your budget and stuff like that. So we just got some stickers printed that said, don't piss away your L&D budget. Mm -hmm. And we went and stuck them in all the urinals and all yeah. the back of all the cubicles. Uh, it cost us 10 quid. And it was the most tweeted picture from the event. And there was people who were saying, oh, it was the best bit of marketing they'd seen. It cost us a tenner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not saying you have to do it. Did exactly you post that, that online as well, though? Did it have a but again, yeah, what happened? Yeah. Well, funnily enough, it wasn't just, like you said, it's what other people do with the content as well. So yeah, we yeah. posted it and said, look what we've done. And we've used it numerous times since to show yeah. it as an example. Yeah. But the actual event, the, the people that were recording the event and documenting the event took a picture of it and then posted it out to their mailing list, which was 90,000 people in L&D. Oh, right. nice. That's who we sold to. Nice. So that £10 stuff. So they weren't pissed off if like, you'd stick it up the toilet. No, they weren't. <laughs> However, interestingly enough, like you get like jealous competitors on day two, day three of the event mm. had like ripped them off or put their stickers on top. But yeah, the joke's yeah. gone now. Yours yeah. don't even say don't piss away your L&D budget. Yeah. Um, so obviously th we got that kind of... Um, backlash from some of the people but we were deliberately trying to needle them yeah we yeah, were yeah. we were disruptive we yeah, were doing things yeah. they didn't want to do 
So now they just look stupid for trying to like be a bitch about it or trying yeah, to face yeah. it. But yeah. um, that was probably our biggest thing. And it had not only an immediate impact because then people would say, oh, I've seen your stickers in the toilets. Yeah. Everyone has to go to the toilet at the events. They last for ages. But it was A, being put in that newsletter and then being shown to people that didn't even attend the event. Mm. 90,000 people was on the yeah, list. Yeah. 50% may, might have opened it. So potentially yeah. we're in 30 to 60,000 people's inboxes. <laughs> a summary of the event that's talking about the specific thing they think. Yeah. And then obviously website traffic increased, checked our socials increased, our audience grew. Mm. Oh, these guys are doing something a bit different. Yeah. Saving the world from boring learning. It aligns with the brands and yeah. they might find some more content marketing. Then all they're yeah. saying. So would you say the, the, the biggest impact from that or was it, was it the, um, was it the uh, event itself and what you got from that or was it the, aftermath of aftermath. it being posted and aftermath it, yeah. yeah yeah so it's yeah, what yeah. we did with it and what happened with it sort of naturally and yeah. unfortunately <laughs> you can't always recreate that you can recreate mm. the bit that you do you don't know what impact it will have or the how it will be received yeah. you can't guarantee that oh well, someone's then going to publish it and mm. you know this is going to happen with it well that's a big outlay isn't it and i think think it, I mean? it, it doesn't have to be the things that you do don't have to be expensive you know I, more often than not it's the idea um, that's why we do a lot of similar stuff to what you're doing there, but it's, it's essentially content market. Cause even though it's guerrilla marketing that we do the point of our out home stuff, I mean, for instance, the job campaigns we've done, we've done two, right? We've done the, the, the one that was the honest job campaign about how shit it is to work for us. Um, it's not, it's not, it's all right. Um, and then we've got the other one that's, uh, <laughs> the religious one we've just done recently, which is just taking the piss out of prayers and the fact that our taglines were praying for a decent video, video, uh, editor. And both of those campaigns, had we just relied on what we were doing outside of it, it would have just been on that local area. Well, I've seen where the this campaign where the, already. Where the posters are, are stuck, right? It'd only be on the um, in the local area. But it's the it's the impact of posting that online that yeah. drove 200 applications to us, the, where we've ended up with within a couple of weeks um, a couple down to on our shortlist that, that one we're going to offer, um, and that's kind of the, the the reality of doing that and the cost of it um, versus the cost of someone going and paying to be in Forbes or paying to be here or, you know, um, doing some uh, huge big pr uh, production advert for a product they don't know whether they, they, they don't know whether it's going to sell yet or, or have market fit. It just seems mental to me. There's so many different ideas that you can, you can do where you're going to spend the fucking hundred quid like you did. Yeah, yeah. And the impact of that, because it was, the idea was good enough is, is, is miles better. So can it be done on a shoestring? Absolutely. I thought what's quite interesting is yeah. in both of your examples, it was doing something out of home, low cost, but then making sure you brought that to the digital world yeah. by taking pictures and sharing it. The, Same con the content is more important than the actual yeah. thing itself. But also as well, there's, there's numerous examples of people shooting some content on their mobile and it launching big brands and stuff like that. But, yeah. but, but they're unicorn examples. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's it would yeah. be hard to say oh well look at this brand that did this and then they made ten million. Yeah. I reckon ninety nine point nine nine percent of the people that might watch this podcast, yeah. smart people that yeah. want to better themselves, um, they aren't going to do that. So I'm trying to give them examples of stuff that they actually can do from my own experience that's worked rather than examples that we don't know anything yeah. about. If that makes sense. Topic six: How to measure if it's working or not. So measuring the success of your content effort. How do you know if it's working? Lots of people talk about page views, organic traffic, bounce rates. What are your tips for someone just getting into this? So it's one of the most frustrating questions, but I think it comes back to that point that we've made previously, which is what is your intention or what is your very clear business goal? Then you can map it against that. Is it getting you closer to that thing, whatever it might yeah. be? If, if your intention was to get a thousand subscribers on a YouTube channel and you were on zero and now you're on 200, well, yes, it's obviously working to a certain point. Mm. If it was to increase your business from uh, 1,000 pounds a month, monthly recurring revenue to 10,000 and you're now at three and a half thousand, yes, it must be working. So how you measure its success would vary from different person to different person. Yeah. If you're expecting to post one piece of content and you're going to all of a sudden earn 10 million pounds worth of inbound sales and you're going to sit on your hands and not do anything, it's probably not going to work by anything, by the, the metric that you're measuring it by, if that makes sense. Does so I think mm. it varies from business to business, person to person, which is a shit way of doing it because yeah. often, often people compare it and go, well, this got 600,000 impressions. 
but you can't pay any bills mm. with impressions. Yeah, that yeah. shouldn't be what you're aiming for. There's a, there's, a di- there's, there's, there's different um, there's different things to pay attention to. I always think. I think because you get kind of those people. I, I always make some often I see um, when content marketers pop up on on the feed or, or personal branding coaches, and they go, you know, they have got fucking. 10 likes and they go it's not about the likes it's about it's about keeping posting keeping going you put your story out for people to come to you because you never know who's in it i'll tell you who's in it with 10 likes nobody 10 people and fucking maybe people like me have gone the fuck is that um it's, it's gonna do nothing for you right so there's there's a little bit there is value in getting a reasonable amount of engagement i'm not saying you have to go viral but a reasonable amount of engagement because that that tells you two things. It tells you that your audience is engaged with what you're saying. They actually want to see it, right? Because people do react to things that they want to see. You can look at the way they act and the way they comment, and you can gain a lot of insights from that to build, again, that audience profile. Um, and it also gives you a bit of legitimacy in that people go, right, he's pretty, he knows what he's talking about because other people think he knows what he's talking about. So therefore, you know, and, and so all those things are, are good. It also, what it does is is it, it the more... Uh, engagement you get, particularly specific, uh, specific to your target audience, there's a good chance, particularly in places like LinkedIn, that it's going to land in the feeds of their uh, followers or network or whatever, who probably all also have the same interests. Potentially, are your target audience as well, so that it kind of spreads it. You need it if you get if you get five likes on a post, it ain't spreading anywhere, anywhere. No one else is seeing it, right? So in that respect, numbers can be important, but they're not the be all and end all like you, and it has to be the right numbers. If you'll just keep posting about, oh, you fucking dog's your only employee and look how cute he is and there he is on the laptop and he's tapping his paws on it. I mean, that's all well and good, right? But the audience you're building, if you're fucking selling, I don't know, uh, cleaning products, probably isn't the right audience, right? So you're just getting numbers for the sake of it. If you get a reasonable amount of numbers that your target audience, that's really valuable because that shows you're building an audience, you're building trust and, and you're putting stuff out that they want to see, right? That's, that's your starting point. But then Mike's completely right as well in that, uh, the amount of people that have we've got to that starting point who then haven't followed up in it anyway afterwards and like we said before use that ta- use the engagement and the conversations we were having to to then put th- those people into some sort of marketing or sales funnel yeah um it, it, it is amazing so they sit there going yeah we're getting good numbers good numbers right target audience but now what mm-hmm. so there's, there's there's got to be a bit of follow-up and you've got to like you said constantly have that goal in mind of even though I'm getting these numbers, how am I going to take these numbers now, the right numbers, and how am I going to drive them towards my ultimate goal, whether it's building a subscriber list or an email list, whether it's selling more, whatever it might be. So um, if we talk specific, say we take Ben, for example, sorry, Ben, to use you know, as, a, as a case study, and Ben wants to grow his videography business. Yeah. What sort of engagement rates, sh- so, say he starts posting video on LinkedIn, yeah. how, how does he choose which platform to start on and what sort of results should we be expecting to see to Getting whether this is worthwhile or not. Can I, before we get into that, there's yeah. one thing that I do very clearly with Ben beforehand, and I think this is a problem that lots of people do, especially in those types of industries. They start trying to create content to please or appeal to other people in that niche in terms yeah. of competitors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So videographers, graphic designers do it all the time, animators do it all the time. And I say this because of what Iron Productions do when we're doing the animated explainer video stuff they put out content to show other animators how clever they are or how good yeah. they are. Your ideal client doesn't give a fuck about frame rates or the um, exposure of a lens. Yeah. So you don't want to be making that type of content, but it's very, very easy because that's your world to create that content. Mm. Who are you appealing to? If you're a copywriter, you shouldn't write for other copywriters. You shouldn't give a fuck what other copywriters think of yeah. your copy, really. You yeah. should be writing for and creating content for your ideal client, which might be Jim owners or it could be small business owners or it could be startups that's who you care about you're writing and creating content for them rather than Mm. i'm going to look like the best videographer to other videographers what so your competitors think you that you're good yeah Yeah. completely completely now what completely so so step one for ben there is again sorry ben to keep using so step one for anyone in ben's type of position Mm. is be clear on who you're creating the content for For, number one like, like we said before it's about them yeah not about you yeah, yeah. so you can like whatever you want yeah oh it's really like mice it's really easy to talk about fucking yeah. uh writing because it's what i do every day and i've got a, a fucking english gcse right but no one gives a fuck like say what they want to know is how you can then 
right in a way that's specific to their business to drive what they're after. Or, yeah. or entertainment, or general entertainment. General Someone entertainment. like Dave Officer seems to do that well. Yeah. Graphic design. Dave Officer, watches Dave the, Harlan, yeah. both of those people entertain, yeah. but they also yeah. give value about how how they can use that for your business and design you a logo or write this for you. Yeah. Step, step one is agreed. Yeah. Now, how, how does that bleed into what pa- platform Ben would decide is where he should be posting? So, spending most yeah. like, so he would then need to look at where is my ideal client hanging out? Or yeah, who would exactly I like right. to work yeah. for? Or where do they go? to find services like me. Now, yep. if he wanted to do wedding videos, it might be, um, and that's where the niche that he wanted. So he said, kind of pick a niche. So if he mm. wanted to do music videos, he might be in different places to where he'd be if he was doing wedding videos. He mm. might go wedding videos, let's go to wedding exhibitions. Yep. Let's set up a nice website. Let's go and join some forums, which are for newlyweds planning your wedding in 2023. Like that's the kind of content he would be producing mm. and the places he would be going to discuss these things. Corporate video LinkedIn yeah. recruitment companies. LinkedIn. Yeah, if you wanted to do corporate videos, he might go there. If you wanted to do music videos, he might go, it might be more Instagram, it might be more TikTok, it might be those types of things, whatever, yeah. YouTube. So you kind of go the niche that you want to work in. Sometimes your target audience exists in places that you wouldn't assume it does, right? Yeah. I kind of said the same thing to to, um, to our, our pharmacy client as well, and I said, there's no reason why you couldn't build an audience on LinkedIn because you've still got fucking loads of people on there who will also be interested in medical products and things for their kids and will also have fucking erectile problems and all this, right? So, so they're still there. You can still do those ads on there. There's an audience there that actually other pharmacies won't have thought of. You might actually um, get a bigger return on them platforms where pro- you're not probably. competing with as many people. Well, Thursday are, right? And that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's what Thursday's model. So if you can figure out where you're, if you could, even better, if you can find a place where your target only to hang out where your competitors haven't realized they do yet, you're absolutely laughing. It should be a lot easier to build an audience on there. Okay, yeah. great. So he, he knows what he should be posting. He knows where he should be posting it. Yeah. How will he know whether it's working or not? That's kind of the, the, this topic. What, what sort of, what's realistic for Ben, I guess? Uh, well, there's, there's several things, isn't there? I mean, ulti- ultimately, it's, it's sales. Does it generate? Right? Does it sale? generate money or not? Mm-hmm. Right? Because otherwise, you don't got a business. But there's also things kind of before that you can, that you can take as wins that mm-hmm. are probably steps towards it, steps in the right direction. And it. And when I say a reasonable amount, if you've not got, a, it's, it's relative to your audience, right? If you've only got fucking ten followers and you're getting you're getting yourself ten likes every time, that's it. You, you, you're building in the right direction, right? If I've got if I've got 100 followers and I'm getting 80 likes every time, that's massive. I've got 80% fucking uh, engagement rate there, right? Um, if you're building it, you kind of got to focus on those figures a bit and, and think. I think that's interesting. Right I've never thought of that. Yeah, yeah but relative right to your followers, and that's, and that's the same thing like going through the leagues. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Don't yeah. compare yourself to oh well, there it's a videographer and he's got um, 9,000 likes on that post. Yeah, but mm. he's also got 200 times size audience. If anything, yeah. you're percentage wise better so building building up an audience that that's you know, the the right people and when you've got a high percentage of engagement uh, uh from within that audience that's what you're after you're not after massive following numbers mm-hmm. that are all the wrong people uh, a, a massive engagement on your post or nothing it's not about massive engagement it's about a high percentage of the following you built engaging with your post because that means they're really engaged they like you and you're building trust so i would say his the key uh performance yeah. indicator there would be it's the engagement he's getting and is he getting more engagement on each post he does as that um as these followers and connections increase i would say but number one um start to track is are you getting bookings are you getting yeah. paid yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. He, he, i would advise him not to make the mistake of thinking that people are going to book you just off your posts yeah. i would go you've liked that post is are you considering getting married yeah. when when are you thinking of married have you got a date booked yet <laughs> where is that yeah uh, will you marry me <laughs> the answer is no. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. It sort of leads into the next topic, which is asking for the sale. What is a call to action and how do you use them in your content? Uh, in my opinion, a call to action is uh, asking your audience to do something. And it could be to uh, click a link. It could be to you know like a post. It could be anything. But you're basically trying to maneuver your audience into uh, doing something that you want them to do. Yeah. Uh, and ideally, that should be aligned to what? Uh, your business does so yeah. do i want to build an email list right cool so you want to drive them somewhere where you'll get their email address off them ultimately that's your goal mm. is it you want yeah. to book a call well your call to action might be you know let me know in the comments if you want to book a call or click here to book a mm. call so it's asking your audience to specifically do something yeah and then you can work out whether or not that post was successful if it gets the outcome yeah. that you're trying to achieve exactly that. and there's two different ways i think there's two different uh things to look at it call uh, a simple 
specific call to action is miles better than trying to be clever. The amount of brands I see and the amount of copywriters I see who try to craft really clever um, uh, calls to action with where they incorporate the product somehow and some sort of pun in there and customers haven't got fucking time to figure that out to then work out what they've got to do and what button they've got to click. It's just, it should be very specific. Make a clever ad, make a clever piece of content, but make sure the call to action is very specific and very simple to understand. Right? That's number one. Um, the other thing on call to actions is if you're just starting off with, with uh, content marketing and don't don't start straight away with a, a, a selling uh, call to action. Don't go straight in with, uh, and if you want to buy my new product, click on the link below, right? That's it. People, you haven't built trust. You've done one yeah. post. They're going to look at you and think, fuck off, you're only trying to sell to me. Um, try other call to actions to either lead them somewhere. So so you can build a mailing list, for instance. You can get people over to your own platform, get them over to your own app. Start taking them off social media, where we, which we all know is dangerous. Um, and... Um, and what you can start to do then is work out how, how they react to different things that you ask them. So we worked out, for instance, people try to be really clever, like if I keep tagging my company, uh, my company page in a post on LinkedIn, I'll get more followers on it. Uh, and what we found was that you get fucking miles more followers if rather than tagging your company page, at the bottom you put, PS, we're trying to build our followers, be honest about it, give our company uh, page a follow for more content like this, something like that. It's really specific, mm -hmm. tells them exactly what they've got to do, and asking them that gets miles more click-throughs and follows than it does if you just tag it in and you think you're being clever. Is it, yeah, it's really interesting. So are we kind of agreeing with Gary Vee in the, uh, you've got to throw some jabs before you throw your right hook? Obviously, he's got the book, yeah, hasn't yeah. he? Jab, I mean, jab, we're, right? we're, not, we're not gimpy enough to describe it like that. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah no, it is right. It, that is right. And this is what I mean. But you know, sometimes I think that people think that we don't agree with lots of things that these gurus say, but even some of the worst gurus or the ones that sort of shit a lot they still say some things that are true you know a yeah. lot of these people have built businesses yeah. and while they are gimpy and they don't do things necessarily the way we would and i would recommend you don't do a lot of the things that they do do there are some things in there that they do that is decent and that's one of them mm. yeah no I, I agree i do think people get call to actions wrong and we're seeing that shift towards zero click content we did a newsletter on that recently yeah. which yeah. was just provide the content with no links whatsoever and it will perform significantly better logic yeah. being yeah. platforms are now punishing people who put links especially if you're trying to push them somewhere else like yeah, yeah. you know a little tease of your blog and then a link to say come and read it on our website yeah it, the algorithm is going to sort of throttle that because it doesn't want to he doesn't want you to leave in its platform where he makes money from you. Yeah. So there's good logic there. It was also it? interesting yeah. as well where they said like you post natively to each platform as well. Yeah. So you almost want to make content specifically for each platform, which I, I kind of get on board with as well. But again, yeah, a lot of businesses yeah. aren't in a position where they can do that or afford to have got the time to. Yeah. So you've almost got to like, where are we going to get the most bang for our buck or the most yeah, return stick, and, and focus to that on platform. That. Don't be mm. one of those people who just takes the same content, does fuck all with it and posts it across all, all different platforms. Yeah. It's just... You just, see, you you just see people, just you see people not shit. even post vertically because they couldn't even be asked flipping the the <laughs> yeah, yeah. ratio of the, the video. It's like, well, now it looks rubbish. So a bit like, oh, well, we've posted it on TikTok. We've posted it on it. But yeah, but it's not even in the right dimension. So yeah, why? Yeah, yeah. It probably would have been better off not doing that yeah. than doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but you are right. Yeah, give people content in the place that they are already there yeah. in a style that they are that's interesting for that platform. Yeah. yeah. Obviously following some rules as well. Unfortunately, you do have to play the algorithm game sometimes um, and you'll probably do a lot better. And that's whether yeah. you give a call to action or you don't give a call to action. Yeah. And I it think. doesn't necessarily mean you can't repurpose across platforms. Oh no, 100%, 100%, 100% you should be repurposed. It's got to be contextualized and it's got yeah. to be yeah. 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 So like, say for example, if I'm posting a, a video on LinkedIn and this is what's interesting, especially when you talk to people about YouTube, they go, and you say, well, don't post a link to YouTube, post it natively on LinkedIn. And they go, well, it's not going to get the same views. It's not mm. going to get the views on YouTube. But if it gets more views on LinkedIn where you actually have a bigger audience, established audience, yep. that's better than posting a link, it being throttled, only being seen to 5% of your followers. Yeah, yeah. And then why you ask what the views are on YouTube if you've been seen by 10 times that amount on LinkedIn and it converts to sales. Mm. The, what you're trying to do is get sales. So yeah, but say if you do post that video to LinkedIn, you could then clip out shorter clips and put them as a reel or a story or a TikTok, let's just say. Yeah. But you wouldn't do it in the same ratio, um, video ratio. So yeah, repurpose, absolutely 100% you should do. But don't just be lazy with your repurposing and go like, oh, it's okay, post that on there, post that on there, post that on there. Simultaneously, like, no, is it optimized so it performs best on that platform? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it optimized so it performs best on that platform? If you are going to repurpose, which you should be doing. 
No, that's good. And that's why it's worth paying professionals that can do all this for you, I think. So kind of finally, um, you, you know, you've, you've now decided what your goal is, you've started creating your content um, and you've put it out there and you've decided what platforms it should be on. So you kind of get to the point of the um, quote, if you build it, they will come, which some believe in content marketing. Um, what do you think about that? No, wrong. No, no. Wrong. No. Was it good things come to those that wait? Is that a saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's bullshit. It's yeah, just, it's fucking nonsense. I guarantee, um, not guarantee, don't don't quote me on this, <laughs> but I reckon if you put two identical businesses together and they did exactly the same content marketing and they got the same engagement on a post, but one of those businesses then went and proactively connected with the people that liked that post, mm. asked them, oh, I've seen you like, like that post about that problem. Have you currently got that problem in your business at the moment? They were either going to say yes or no. If they say no, you could go, well, we've got more content like this coming. Would you like to go on a mailing list? They're not all going to say yes, but a mm. percentage will. And then some people might say, actually, we've got a problem in the moment. You go, oh, great. Do you want to talk about it? Some will say no. Some will say yes. The company that's doing that process after they post the content, if we check back in a year's time and they've done this on every post they've done for that year, I guarantee that the one that had mm. been doing that process and had been also marketing to them mm. on their email marketing list and more of their ideal client was seeing their content because they'd grown that audience that was their ideal client that said they had those issues in the business. They will be further along the road to being successful than the business that isn't. I would almost argue that this business is probably going to be one of those businesses that fails. Yeah. I'd, you I'd... have to do the work. It's horrible and most people don't do it, but this is why it works because most people don't do it. So if you're doing it, you're not competing with everyone in your niche anymore. You're competing with the four or five other businesses that actually do this stuff. And if you go back to the 95-5 rule, where you want to be marketing to these people all year long until they're ready to buy, you are going to have more of those people in that 5% yeah. when it comes to the point that they want to buy stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd always say, um, so I, I'd advise, if you, especially if you're a new business and you still, just started posting and you, you're, you, you, you're still going to, uh, it's still going to be time before you've actually built an audience and built trust with them, right? So it, they're quite, it's quite a fragile thing you've got going on there, right? And I think, I've, I've seen the mistake of... It's not cold pitching, by the way, in DMs. Yeah, it's not that. No, but I've seen, them, yeah, cause I've seen the, yeah, because I've seen the mistake of people doing, of going too far, like like, like you say, into mm -hmm. DMs and things, because they've, they've gone, they've taken the post, they thought that's got a decent amount of engagement. They've gone through, they've got everybody on a list who's their potential target audience, and then they've gone straight into the DMs with a big fucking sales pitch, right? And, and it's... I'd go like uber subtle in that what you should be doing, especially initially, because it'll, it'll, it'll build trust with your audience, it'll um, get them to trust you as, a, as an individual as well, is going into the comments and even as a brand, having conversations with those people, especially if it's a brand and, and it's a brand they, they're starting to like and respect and that brand's having a conversation with them in, in the comments about different things. Um, that, that kind of trust builds and eventually they're, they're probably either going to come to you or if you do in a year's time, decide to DM them, but oh, we've got this offer on with, what you're thinking yeah. if they'd be constantly speaking to you in the comments and you're on these conversations regularly they're not going to tell you to fuck off yeah. but people have got to be really careful and and, and sometimes there's yeah you need new business play. i'm yeah. not saying go there's in there raw, by play, the way yeah but yeah. sometimes new new business owners we, we all know uh, how how tough it can be we all know how uh, bootstrap uh, what bootstrapping is like and when you've got no cash and even when you've got investors breathing down your necks for sales um, people can get desperate and do stupid things like that, but in the long run, it's going to fuck you up. And it, content marketing, like I, like I said before, it's a it's a longer game. Like you say, it's got to be there's got to be a little bit of fucking tickling before. before yeah. You so I always say, like, never ever. There. What I like to do, I like to make um, somebody feel like they've discovered your content because I think it makes it so much more powerful. So that's why I like the search first strategy and talking about topics that I know resonates with my target audience. But mm. I would connect with somebody. And then I wouldn't pitch at them at all. Mm. Knowing full well, because I've got a content marketing plan and strategy that I'm following, I know if this audience like this post, I'm going to post some more content like this in a week's time or in a couple of days time, mm. then I know there's a higher percentage that they're going to see that content again. And they're more likely to engage with it and like it again, because you're talking about the same thing that you knew resonated with them the first time and you're building trust like that. Do you know what I mean? So I wouldn't mm. be going pitching to them that day because they've liked it, but I would be connecting with these people yeah. and stuff like that. And then ideally my call to action was always, like you said, can I get these people off this platform? Mm. Can I get their email? Can I get their, um, can I get their data so I can actually market to them if all this goes to shit and I get yeah. banned or 
they you know make it pay to play whatever it might mm. be because the platforms can change the rules at the drop of a yeah, hat yeah, of so. how do i own my list so if everything goes wrong i could still make money yeah. and my business can still run if this platform no longer exists yeah, in six yeah, months yeah. time so that's that's why you but you have to you have to ask because people aren't just going to go oh i like dan kelso's post yeah. i'm now going to subscribe to offend i'm going to go to offended's website but he's not told me to but somehow i'm going to go to offended website i'm going to click subscribe and i'm going to enter my email address in most people yeah. don't do that no. unless you prompt them to do it yeah. essentially yeah. so you've got to do it either with a call build, to action build trust and that yeah build, build trust and ask him to do it um yeah. and it's a lot different going asking someone to do something like that than it is asking them for straight up for a sale yeah definitely I, I think an, another mistake people make is they think content marketing replaces outbound. Well, actually, it just no. supports and enhances yeah. your outbound. Yeah, yeah, it makes your outbound easier yeah, because yeah, more yeah. people have seen you, heard you, already bought into you. You've got authority, credibility. Yeah, oh, you're yeah, the yeah. guy that did this. Oh, you're the guy that did the blank book. Perfect example, though. We did the blank book stunt. I get asked about that four years later. Yeah. you'll get asked about the book that you did you yeah, know what yeah. i mean not anymore <laughs> no it does yeah. it helps those conversations and i think i think there is a, a shift towards people just wanting the easy easy option put content out and hope people will come to you people have always been like that i think people always inbound, easy option yeah, for anything, inbound really. leads are a bit of a fucking you know myth i always i always tell people that our business is, is built solely on inbound but the, rea the reality is it's not it's it's people do come to us and have conversations and ask us about our services if that's what you call an inbound lead, I don't know how you used to, but is it really? Because the follow up on the back of that is, I'd say, is mostly outbound. Mm. We're having we're having to email email that person, persuade them a bit more, uh, get them nailed down for a pitch, do a proposal, uh, go and present it, then chase them a bit more. There's there's there's, there's, a, there's a whole even though that initial conversation was them starting it, just because they started the conversation, I don't think it it does make it a little bit easier. But I think people get this. In, get this thing in the head of oh they've got inbound leads so that must mean basically what I do I put a bit of content out and they just come and spend money with me. yeah no, that's and, that's and that is the problem with and I would say that is a problem with maybe 95% of the people that think or want to do content marketing they think that's the reality when yeah. it's not yeah. in a weird way content marketing is part of your sales strategy mm. like it's it's it kind of is sales but yeah. it's like the first bit it just gives you a little bit of attention and some eyes on you. What do you do with it next? Yeah. That's where the gold is. I think that's the difference between a company that does all right and a company that goes on to do really, really well in that mm. same niche. So yeah, key takeaway, is there something you'd want, you know, if there's one piece of information you'd want someone to take away from this conversation, what would it be? Content marketing can work for everyone, but it's it's just, that's just the start of the whole process. There's so much more behind it that has to go on. And you know what, even after you've done all that, if you haven't taken a time to, to build trust with an audience, if you haven't found out yet whether your product has got a, a fit in the market, it can all fucking collapse at the end of it anyway because no one fucking buys it. So, but it, it's, it's, it, it needs time. If you're not putting paid, if you're not putting money behind stuff to put your advertising out there to the right people, Trying to grow the right audience by saying the right things is a process and it's a try it's trial and error, like Mike said before. And if if you're not prepared for that and you're not prepared to put the work in that it takes and also the work it, it takes to create some sort of funnel on the back end of it to take those people who are engaging with your stuff into the sales process, you're gonna fail. There's so many different hurdles you can fall down on, but it, it I believe it is possible to do for any brand and anything that you're selling if you do it right. Yeah. And in a weird way, I'm going to kind of echo it, but say something different. It also, it's what you do up front as well. You can't just start putting any old content out no. everywhere and just hope for the best. So in oh. a strange way, if we had to split this whole process into a really good content marketing strategy that's going to work and result in sales, which ultimately most people watching this want more of, more sales, more money in the business. Mm. It's what you do before you even do any content and what you do after once you've created the content and it's actually landed and it's got some sort of engagement. Yep. they're probably the two most important bits of any content marketing strategy sorry about that and i guess um so we're taking our own advice what would our call to action be at the end of this podcast well Ooh. mine personally here would be my call to action would be like if you are struggling with this type of stuff reach out and speak to us like both offended both i'm productions or views of my own we we both we talk about this stuff all the time to businesses of all different sizes so we can find out where you are, what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And if we can't help you, we probably know somebody that can. Mm. And if you've not got any money, we can even tell you cheat ways of trying to do this shit yourself and getting better at it. It's not, 
we're not looking here for people to come to us and spend loads of money with us. It's like, we've been where you are. We've been business yeah. owners. We've had to learn the hard way. We can give you some tips and advice. Unless you're a prick, and then I won't help you. Yeah. Will you help pricks? Uh, it depends on how much money they've got. <laughs> <laughs> there you go.